Okay, I have former CIA Ray McGovern with me today to talk about the Russia-Ukraine war and uh, some other topics. Ray, thank you so much for being on today's show. Most welcome, Stephen. Uh, the, the most common thing that I'm seeing in the news right now is these ongoing daily attacks with uh, Ukrainian drones uh, this seems to be a, a new form of warfare, uh, but now they are definitely pushing into Russia. I, I wonder if you might speak a little bit about that, but the, the biggest thing that I want to know is, is, is there possibly uh, blowback on Ukraine or NATO if they were to hit the wrong target? For example, uh, you know, if they were to hit a military center or something more precious to Putin, could it provoke uh, a, a larger attack? What are, what are your thoughts on these uh, attacks with drones in Ukraine? A really good question, Stephen. And uh, uh, just uh, hours ago, uh, I got word from my operations center that a long range, nuclear capable Russian bomber was, was damaged, perhaps destroyed on an airfield in the Novgorod section of Russia, which is farther inside Russia than any of the Ukrainian uh, drones have penetrated so far. So your question is very timely and apropos. You know, uh, there are two strains of thought here. How long will the Russians, which have the upper hand in Ukraine, let themselves be provoked? You know, how long will Putin be under such pressure from his military and from his civilian sector uh, that he will be unable to resist the pressures to give these guys a bloody nose. You know where Zelensky is. He's traveling all around Europe now. I wonder why. But when he gets back home, you'll know exactly where he is. Zap him. So these are the kinds of pressures that Putin has faced successfully in the past. Now, my view of Putin is that he's a very methodical, very gradual look, the war of attrition. We are, pardon the use of the word, attriting and attriting and attriting some more Ukrainian forces. They've, <laughs> they've just put in their last brigade. You know, I'm reminded of the, of the charge of the light brigade. Do you remember? That was in Crimea, you know? Ours not to reason why, ours but to do or die. Well, that's what's happening in Ukraine. So you, I think Putin's personal preferences will be, look, wait until we're able to destroy this last brigade as well. And then let's see, maybe, maybe the U.S., which is really running things for Ukraine, maybe the U.S. will relent and say, look, maybe now's the time to talk. We probably should have done this months ago, but let's sit down and end this damn thing. And the last thing I'll say is that I find it unconscionable. And I use that word advisedly, advisedly. Um, unconscionable that the the flower of Ukrainian youth and some old guys like me, for God's sake, are being sacrificed on the altar of this of this overweening desire to give Russia. A, bled, not, not, uh, a bloody nose. That's what it is. Uh, and you can look at U.S. government statements that say that. They were in this to give Russia a big defeat. It's not going to happen, Stephen. And if people don't wake up to the fact that it's not going to happen, it may become too late to negotiate. And then things will be even more delicate for Biden in an election year. Yeah, it seems that he wants to have his cake and eat it too, where he wants to be a wartime president that also gets to brag about no American men and women dying uh, in, in the conflict. So it's almost like he wants to have both. Um, but at, at this point, uh, oh, go ahead. Look like you were going to comment on that. No, I was going to say, you know, casualty adverse. Uh the best military analysts that I know, from McGregor, among others, has said that the Ukrainian armed forces have suffered between 400 and 500,000 
killed in action. Now, even the Western press has been saying 500,000, but they say, well, it's both the Ukrainians and Russians. Uh, 500,000, whatever it is, okay? That's incredible. That's terrible, okay? And what the Western press is now saying is, oh, you know, the Ukrainian forces, they're kind of casualty. Uh, they're adverse to casualties. They're, they're growing sort of coward. What's the word? Casualty adver adverse, they say. Well, my God, <laughs> how many? Let's say it's only 300,000, okay? How many more casualties do the Ukrainians have to suffer to be not called, incredibly, casualty adverse? I would just add this, and I think the Western press, the mainstream press, is what is are the people, I call them prostitutes in unpolite conversation. Those are the people who are casualty adverse. They don't want to say anything that might knock them off the air or make sh or, or give them a different job other than uh, singing in the sweetness of uh, Volodymyr Zelensky on on the tube or on you know on, on uh, one of the stations of TV. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what the mainstream media is putting out. Just two days ago, the New York Times reported there's been over three hundred thousand casualties and deaths. However. Ukraine is winning because 120,000 of those have been Russians, while only 70,000 of those have been Ukrainians. So they're, they're going just the opposite of what these military intel people are saying. Um, it, it's almost like the, the British press and the American press have colluded to put forward this illusion that Ukraine is somehow winning this war but they're now they're now coming out and, and publicly saying that that Russia has more casualties and more deaths than Ukraine, and yet every other world newspaper and military analyst is saying just the opposite. It's that Ukraine has been bloodied and pummeled and pushed into the ground. They're the ones digging graves all day long. It's not Russia. What are your thoughts on the New York Times pushing out the, the these numbers? Well, the New York Times is not uh, not to be believed on these things. Uh, the figures come pretty reliably from things like satellite photography, where, as you point out, Stephen, graves are being dug up from previous wars and, and mass graves are being filled with new casualties. Those would be dead people, not wounded people. <laughs> OK, now, on the Russian side, we do not have good figures. Uh, most people, most military analysts that I trust put those figures as much lower, lower than 100,000. Now, that's still 100,000, but if not 300, 400, as McGregor says, almost a half million killed. OK, so this whole notion that uh, the Ukrainians are being a little cowardly here, they're casualty adverse, uh, averse. I mean, give me a break, for God's sake. They're fighting this war. With respect to who's winning, well, about six weeks ago, uh, the head of CIA, William Burns, said Russia has already lost this war, and uh, and the weakness of the Russian military has been laid bare for the whole world to see. Five days later, President Biden got up in Helsinki and said the Russians have already lost this war. And he looked at his notes and he said, did I tell you that the Russians have already lost this war? He said it three times. Now, who's telling them that stuff? It's not true. Even Zelensky two days ago said, well, we hope that the Russians will lose this war. Like he used the future tense for God's sake. And he said, hope. The evidence is such that the Russian military machine has used those critical winter months to build up a, a defense that is impregnable. And now the question is, will they go on full-scale offense before the, well, the muddy season comes in? What do they call it? The, uh, uh, forget now. Uh, well, anyhow, it comes in into effect around October and then you can't move. So what will the Russians do before then? 
I don't know. I ask my military experts, and the best of them say, we don't know, but only Putin knows, and he probably hasn't decided himself. Yeah, okay. Would you say it's it's fair to say that um, the military-industrial complex of the United States is giddy about this opportunity to unload old, decades-old equipment and rake in, you know, a hundred billion dollars for the opportunity to build all new advanced weaponry. Uh, are, are these guys, you know, drooling at the mouth for this opportunity, or do they see this war as a shame, a humanitarian crisis that needs to be shut down? That's really a good question. Yeah, they're they're drooling at the mouth. Okay, uh, our defense secretary, uh, Lloyd Austin is about to be cashiered if common sense prevails. What will he do? Will he be out on the street with a, with a cup asking for <laughs> He'll go back to being on the board of Raytheon, <laughs> which is one of the main defense companies, raking it in. Now, here's an interesting thing, Stephen. You know uh, Colonel Doug McGregor. He's a really good friend of mine, and I turned to him for, for things like this. I asked him a question just yesterday. I said, Doug, uh, the uh, the effectiveness of the most sophisticated U.S. weaponry that we're giving to Ukraine, uh, the effectiveness is nil. The Russians are zapping it in a most embarrassing way. They even have video. I mean, they, all these all these tanks that the Germans and the French are, and all these armored personnel characters. Are, I mean, hello. Are, let me let me ask you this, Colonel McGregor. Um, is it possible that the military industrial complex for once would see a disincentive to continuing this war, lest their sales to other countries of all this sophisticated stuff be curtailed or even disparaged? What about that? <laughs> and he said, it's a good question, Ray, but look, <laughs> they're giving Ukraine all the old stuff they have in stock. It's outmoded. They're working on new stuff. And what they'll say to these these folks that they want to sell the new stuff to is, oh, the stuff we have now is much better, much better than the stuff that the Russian military has uh, has been destroying in Ukraine. So it's a gravy train, Ray. No, it won't have any disincentive. So that's the question. That, that's the answer that I would give you, Stephen. It's really hard to, 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 to stomach. But money speaks. And these guys are making tons of money. They have no sense of, they have every sense of impunity. Look at what Lloyd Austin, where he comes from and where he'll go back to. I mean, if anyone should have been able to know the military situation uh, that, uh, you know, that in which the Americans, not urged, but required that Ukraine make this counteroffensive against all these odds with no air support, with no air support. I mean, give me a break. Uh, anyone should have known that, including Lloyd Austin. Now, he's going to keep his mouth shut. What I hope is that General Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he's on his way out. He's retiring. Maybe, just maybe he'll say, you know, this is really terrible. We shouldn't require any more from young Ukrainians and all guys like me. Let's go to the negotiation, negotiating table, which, as a matter of fact, he said half a year ago, and let's work this damn thing out. That's the solution here. I hope Billy is, well, is sturdy enough to finally admit that, look, I don't have to, I don't have to repeat, regurgitate what CNN and MSNBC says anymore. I'm going to speak my mind uh, to prevent further carnage. The first purpose, the first principle of, fir of, of first aid, for God's sake, is stop the bleeding. The bleeding is going on with hundreds of Ukrainians being killed every day. Yeah, yeah, it's a, a real humanitarian crisis at, at, at this point. Um, Jake Sullivan of the White House says that the F-16 jets will definitely get to Ukraine. Uh, but not until everyone is trained and the United States feels it's it's ready to give its blessing. Um, is Ukraine going to run out of bullets and bodies before these F-16s arrive? And 
Have the Abram tanks we promised a year ago, have they even arrived at this point? I, I, I've not read that they even arrived. Uh, and now we're promising jets. Well, Stephen, as we veteran intelligence professionals for sanity as a group told President Biden on the 26th of January this year, all these new wep weapons are going to arrive late to the party. Okay. They're going to be too late. So you've done your homework. You know exactly the, the right question to ask. Now, what is the military saying? Well, let's remember that the F-16 permission given by Biden was given out in the Far East when he learned uh, from Zelensky, oops, that Bakhmut uh, offensive, we lost. Sorry, we lost. There needed to be some sort of headline saying, oh, it's going to be all right. And Biden, alone with Sullivan, says, oh, yeah, we're going to give him F-16s. So what does General Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, say? Well, you know, that's that's fine. Uh, bear in mind, uh, aside from the training and, and the competence of our pilots and their ability to speak English, I mean, are we going to give them 64 or maybe as many as 100? Well, please bear in mind that, <laughs> that the Russians have several hundred, maybe a thousand of this kind of very sophisticated aircraft. Uh, actually, uh, if it would take years and years to build up to even half match what the Russians already have. And it's going to take a while. Okay, that was about four or five weeks ago, as I recall. Two days ago. What the hecker? <laughs> General Hecker who's Supreme Allied Commander of all Air Forces. Okay, what did he say? He said, oh, please, these F-16s, don't, don't misunderstand, they're not going to be, a, they're not going to be a silver bullet. Uh, matter of fact, you know, it's going to be probably till this time next year, we have to get these people so that they uh, speak English and understand English, then they have to get them trained. And it, it's going to, it's going to take a, a real long time. So what am I saying here? I'm saying, Finally, finally, the military is standing up and saying, OK, Mr. President, you can say F-16s out there in Manila or wherever you were, uh, F-16s are no magic bullet. They're not going to really help. And if you put them up in the air, they're going to be shot down by a far more capable and a far more plentiful group of Soviet aircraft that they've developed over the last two decades that are a are, uh, for which our aircraft are no match. Yeah. Okay. And, and those tanks, our 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 commitment to those tanks has not arrived yet, right? Yeah. I uh, well, as far as I know, the Abrams have not arrived. Uh, I keep being mystified uh, at the news that they will arrive. They will arrive soon, because I do not know how the Abrams tanks are going to escape the kind of punishment. Uh, that the Russians have been inflicting on the Leopard 2s and the French and the British tanks and all that stuff. Uh, the, the supremacy of intelligence, surveillance, and immediacy, which allows satellites and others to identify these things, pinpoint them, and then call on an immediate retaliatory strike, is that it's the first time in warfare that this has been practiced. And the Russians are doing it all too well for Ukrainian purposes. I don't know how Abrams is going to escape this same kind of fate. Yeah. Well, I, I read today in the in the British news, The Sun, uh, that one of their fighter jet pilots found himself not in a dogfight, but basically uh, in a skirmish, for lack of a better word, three Russian fighter jets against him. They're going back and forth. Uh, they're they're getting on each other's tails, but they're not firing. And you can hear the pilot. He's terrified. I, I, I don't know what to do. I, I, if I fire, I could launch World War Three. And, and, and so like there's all this fear. But at the same time, this could become the shot heard around the world. He's not wrong. And, and so like this thing is a powder keg that could go off. And yet you know, we can't get the advanced weaponry there, then we don't have the air support to even protect it. Um, meanwhile, people just keep dying. They are tritting and a tritting and a tritting, as you, as you say, it, it, it makes me very nervous. <laughs> uh, you know, 
maybe the best thing to do is to not watch this stuff because uh, the the likelihood that this thing could escalate is far greater than de-escalation at this point. That's right. And uh, it really depends on the situation in the United States in a thoroughly political year. Now, Putin has said often in the past, and he knows this from bitter experience, that U.S. foreign and military policy is a function of domestic political considerations. He said that. He said foreign policy is hostage to domestic political considerations. Now, what puts my hair on edge is the notion that uh, the people advising Biden might think that the escalation could include you know, these just these small little, ah, just a little small, I mean, just the size of Hiroshima, for God's sake, a tactical nuclear weapon, or maybe just half the size of, I mean, hello, that's crazy. Now, why would they be that crazy? Well, you know, in addition to their lack of savvy up till now, they have a big problem, a personal stake in this. As you know, Stephen, your audience probably knows some of this, uh, Hunter Biden and his dad are in trouble deep. There is documentary evidence suggesting bribery, suggesting uh, taken stuff, to, uh, suggesting uh, formulating things in Ukraine to, to uh, be consonant with uh, Hunter Biden's uh, need for millions and millions of dollars. Okay, so those are the Bidens. What about the people who are really running this show? Tony Blinken. What about Sullivan? Well, let's take Blinken first. Blinken is it is has been identified by a former CIA director as having asked for fifty one former intelligence managers to say at the end of October. 2020, that that Hunter laptop, which had all this very damaging stuff and which the FBI had already verified as authentic. <laughs> so these guys, 51 of them, were recruited to say, oh, you know what? That message about Hunter's laptop, it bears all the earmarks of a Russian intelligence misinformation project, 51 of them. Who asked for that? Tony Blinken. Who says he asked for it? The guy who arranged it for the CIA, uh, Mike Morrell, okay? Yeah, Mike Morrell, yeah. There's a lawsuit now. There's a lawsuit trying to get, uh, under the Freedom of Information Act, trying to get the, the records at the CIA, at their Publications Review Board, which apparently was involved, get the records to see exactly how this but my point is simply this blinken is directly involved and sullivan not least sullivan sullivan was the brainchild of russia gate the russians hacked at the democratic national committee now most of your audience probably don't know that that has been that has been shot down by formal under oath testimony by the head of the CrowdStrike outfit that the FBI said, please look into, do a forensic study on the Democratic National Committee. The head of that, head of CrowdStrike, his name is Sean Henry. He testified, if you got a pencil, he testified on December 5th, 2017, that there was absolutely zero technical evidence that anyone hacked those damaging emails to Hillary Clinton from the DNC. Zero evidence. Not the Russians, not anyone. Now, what happened to that? Adam Schiff, head of the House Intelligence Committee, hid that for two and a half years. On May 10th, 2020, yeah, 2020, so two and a half years later, um, the New York Times was given a copy of this uh, because uh, because Trump said, look, release that stuff. And the new head of the 
the Intelligence Committee did so. Well, what happened? Well, that was May 10th, 2017. What's today? August 22nd, 2023. No, May 10th to 20, when it was published, when it was made available to all the media. Now, August 2023. I just ask all your audience, do they know that the head of CrowdStrike testified under oath that there was no Russian hacking, no other hacking, no outside hacking of the DNC. They probably don't know that because the New York Times has kept this secret. Now, uh, it's the evidence is out there. So what I'm saying is put yourself put yourself in the position of Trump, of Hunter, <laughs> not Trump, but Biden, Hunter, Hunter Biden, Joe Biden, Tony Sullivan and Tony, uh, Anthony, Jake Sullivan and then Tony Blinken. Okay. There's a personal stake in this. Now, I'm thinking, trying to put myself in that position. My God, if Trump wins, you know, I'll end up in jail because the evidence is out there. And Trump is not the kind of guy now he was before, but he's not going to tread lightly on this. Uh, we did him in. Um, we almost prevented him from being elected in the first place. And then, of course, we did him in by, by helping the CIA to lie about the authenticity of the laptop. And he's going to come and, come and get us. So what's, what's, what's the implication here? Clearly, Joe Biden's got to win, okay? Now, what will these guys do to make, make it look like a win? My God, I'm afraid to tell you, but I do not rule out their use of tactical nuclear weapons, and the Russians have already made quite clear that if that happens, they will use them in return. Um, there's a book behind you. Uh, speaking of CIA collusion, uh, setting up a president, um, you know, doing horrible, awful things to people in charge that don't meet their uh, agenda or narrative. Um, I'm currently going through JFK and the unspeakable. And uh, as I go through this, it is so well documented now that people within the CIA uh, were actively uh, trying to get JFK to attack Russia, to attack Cuba. He, he would not buy into their narratives. They would try to blackmail him, set him up. Finally, uh, it, it looks like take him out. As you've studied that, as you've gone through that book over and over again, the name Alan Dulles keeps coming up. The, the Washington DC airport is named after this guy as if he was a hero. Uh, Kennedy hated him, believed he was not a great guy. And then ultimately, ultimately it looks like he was a part, if not of the crime, certainly of the cover up made sure to get himself on, on the Warren Commission. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on the, the, the CIA colluding to uh, attack Kennedy while alive and then ultimately take his life? What are your thoughts on Alan Dulles? Well, Stephen, uh, first of all, um, there were Dulles brothers, right? One was the Secretary of State, one was Alan, the culprit that you're mentioning. Now, I would never fly out of Dulles Airport if it were named after the head of the CIA. It's named after his brother. The oh, his brother. Okay. So, okay. so I, I make I make a, a compromise for that. I'll fly out of Dulles anytime. I mean, the Secretary of State was just as bad. You can't believe the aura of, of fear of the communists in those days and the Russians and that. Our military wanted to zap them, wanted to do a nuclear war against them. Well, well we still could. Well, we still had preeminence. How many Americans would die? Probably only about 20 million. JFK walked out of that meeting and said, and they call us the sensible human race. So he was up against it. And he tried very artfully to manage things. Um, number one, to get out of Vietnam. Now, people say, well, Kennedy sent 16,000 troops to Vietnam. He did do that. They were all advisory. They were told not to interfere there. And he decided this was crazy. Maxwell Taylor, his military assistant, said, yeah, this is no good. 
we ought to get those guys out of here. And he issued two executive orders. You probably already came to that part of the book, uh, which would re which would withdraw a thousand uh, American troops from South Vietnam by the end of 1963, the year that uh, Kennedy was killed, and the bulk of the rest of them by the end of uh, 1965. The Mulitzer was aghast. Uh, the conservative uh, news media, my, my God, he, Kennedy's giving South Vietnam up to the communists, and before you know it, Indonesia and all of Southeast Asia, well, they will fall like dominoes, okay? That's what he had to contend with, all right? Now, as far as Alan Dulles is concerned, he had his personal. Personal things really mean a lot in Washington if you're a bigwig, okay? He advised Kennedy during uh, his first year in office that, look, we have this pay of pig, Bay of Pigs operation, a bunch of, uh, bunch of Cuban, Cuban uh, forces led by and trained by us are going to invade Cuba and Castro is going to fall and everything's going to be really good. It'd be good for you politically too, Mr. Uh, Mr. Kennedy. Now, John Kennedy looked at that and he said, where does this come from? Oh, Mr. Kennedy, you should know that President Eisenhower before you approved this plan. So they put Kennedy on the spot, right? So what does he do? He says, this doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but if Eisenhower approved it, I just want to let you know that do not expect U.S. armed forces to be deployed if anybody gets into trouble when you land on the beach of the baby. You got that? Got that? No U.S. forces. Well, you know what happened. They needed help. There was no insurrection. Castro was winning. They appealed to John Kennedy. He said, I thought I told you guys not to appeal to me. Now, is that fiction? No, it's not fiction. A, a historian found on Alan Dulles's uh, desk after he died, uh, coffee-stained notes that said, when push comes to shove, when Kennedy sees that the whole enterprise, getting rid of Castro, is about to fail. He will not be able to resist politically our requests for support. That's that's right there. Okay. So Kennedy was enraged, right? He he let himself tell a neighbor up in Hyannisport, yeah, I like to I like to break the CIA up into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the wind. Now that didn't go over real well with the CIA guys, anyhow. Well, let's not go into the actual assassination. I will tell you this, that after the assassination, when LBJ, I've asked the author of this book, James Douglas, did L LBJ know about the assassination? It's a big question, isn't it? Uh, his Secret Service folks knew something because they dissuaded Johnson from going to Chicago the week before where similar plans were being laid. Well, uh, Jim says, Jim is a really careful guy. He never exaggerates. He always has, you know, footnotes and stuff. And he said, I, I, my guess is that, yeah, he kind of knew something was going to happen. Whether he knew chapter and verse, I don't know. But, but uh, yeah, he probably did. So what does LBJ do? Well, he needs to... Uh, people are saying, my God, this, he was assassinated. Maybe the security services in the United States were involved. Maybe the FBI, or maybe the no, maybe the CIA was involved. And so what does, what does uh, Johnson do? He appoints, he, he, he appoints a, an august committee headed by former Chief Justice Earl Warren. And what does Warren do? I think at Johnson's suggestion, he says, well, now, we need somebody really well versed in all this stuff. Alan Dulles, former head of the CIA, since cashiered by Kennedy. I let, why don't you come on the, the, the panel there? And if you look at those all those men there, all white men, right? <laughs> None of them know much about this. Alan Dulles ran the damn investigation. Okay. Yeah. Not only that, but Truman, Truman, who created the CIA. Exactly a month after the assassination of John Kennedy. And we have his notes in those weeks before he wrote this. Exactly a month, he published an op-ed in the Washington Post, which said, I didn't create 
the CIA to do anything but to give me untreated substantive intelligence. They've gone astray here. We better pull them back. <clears throat> That's a paraphrase. <clears throat> but that was his op-ed. Guess what? In those days, and I was around in those days, there were two, sometimes three editions of the Washington Post. Oh, it appeared in the first edition. It slipped out of the second edition, the third edition. Nobody else touched it. The media, only in Independence, Missouri, it got a copy. <laughs> it wasn't also published. Whoa, now isn't that interesting? So who controls the media? Who controlled the media way back then? And I'll give you one little personal experience. I entered the CIA in April 1963. In June, President Kennedy makes this incredible speech. Look, the Russians are human beings as well as, as us. Uh, they, they want a good future for their children. I don't want to have another Cuban Missile Crisis. Let's deal with them. Okay. And I'm thinking, wow, that's interesting. Okay. Now, I go into a training course. I was with some pretty high-level muckety mucks, most of them from the Ivy Leagues, right? And uh, so we're, we're exposed to all kinds of things, including covert action operators. Now, in October of 2000, of 1963, right in the midst of our training, uh, we were down at an off-site, okay, the farm. I can't tell you where that is, uh, classified. And in comes this well-introduced tall fellow, fairly tall, and he's going to tell us about John Kennedy and Cuba. Well, it was a diatribe. I mean, John Kennedy came off as a treasonous, uh, pro-communist uh, guy that's just awful. Now, this is when Kennedy was still... In office, he was a president. I remember thinking, my God, right? <laughs> I mean, he works for John Kennedy. You're just like, I, I do. Or I'm going to. What's going on here? You know, I think that was E. Howard Hunt. We, we weren't allowed to take. We were not to keep our notes, okay? And this, you know, just from seeing photos of Hunt, it, it rings a certain bell, but I don't care who it was. This was a CIA operations officer saying all the things that Alan Dulles was saying before the Bay of Pigs, after the Bay of Pigs. It's a little personal insight into how fervid, how how angry, and how willing to, re not only to retaliate, but to save the world from Russian communism, uh, Southeast Asia, Vietnam, all stuff, how these people got together, the military, the CIA, Parts of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover knew about this, and even a couple people in Secret Service. Uh, if you if you have, if you want to read a good book on this, it's already been recommended. I know James Douglas. He has no access to grind. He's a Catholic worker for God's sake. He runs a hospitality house in in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, for people who have nowhere else to eat or to sleep. Well, I, I look forward to read or finishing the book, but a, as I'm reading it, I'm just looking at this Biden situation with the CIA, this Trump situation with the CIA, and it really does beg the question, who's really running the United States of America, right? There's a lot of uh, interest from other people that are not elected on what wars we're in, the money they extract from us, which companies get contracts, which politicians get limelight which ones get demoted it's it's all very very fascinating well i appreciate you coming on ray this has been a, a very insightful conversation as always um thank you so much i know you do a ton of research and i appreciate you taking time away from your family to to help educate us on what's really going on thanks for the opportunity Stephen. good luck to you Thank you. If, if you want to learn more or follow Ray, go to raymcgovern.com and you can learn more. Again, thank you for coming on today. Most welcome. See you next time.